Happy Sabbath, family. Happy Sabbath, family. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, family. Beloved, I believe that it's a very special day. I believe that it is a very special day. Is it the Sabbath of the Lord our God? Is that special? Did we have new family members come into the church of God this morning? Is that special? Oh, beloved. Yes, Sister Mary. Hallelujah is right. By show of hands, how many of us in here are Seventh-day Adventists? Praise the Lord. I want you to think in your mind, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? By show of hands, does anyone in this room believe we are Seventh-day Adventists only, keyword, because of the Seventh-day Sabbath? Does anyone in this room believe that we are Seventh-day Adventists only because we keep the Seventh-day Sabbath? Last night, we spoke about our prophetic birth date. The Bible said in the book of Daniel, chapter 8 and verse 14, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Now I'm going to give you a quick pop quiz. You know Brother Paul likes to do that. Are you ready? Are you ready? I hope, beloved, if you're not ready, you can't get the sticker. I hope you're ready. The Bible said unto 2,300 days. Now we studied last night and we saw that in Bible prophecy, one day is symbolic of how many years? One year. So then when we're talking about the 2,300 day prophecy, we're talking about a 2,300 year prophecy. Is that Bible? Did we see that last night? Does anybody remember the date that began the 2300 day prophecy? Yes, 457 BC or AD? BC. In 457 BC, the Bible said in Daniel chapter 9, beginning at verse 24, know and understand therefore that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, that is Jesus, amen, would be a period of seven weeks, three score and two weeks. 62 weeks, three score, amen, and a period of seven weeks until the coming of the Messiah. We followed the time prophecy down to the year 27 AD where the Messiah began his mission. Does anybody remember what the word Messiah means? Anointed one. I asked you the question last night. If Messiah means anointed one, and you and I could discover from the word of God when Jesus became the Messiah, the anointed one, then we would understand the prophecy better. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. When in Jesus' earthly ministry, I told you it was a pop quiz, beloved. You're looking at me like I'm testing you because I am. When in Jesus' earthly ministry was he anointed by the Spirit of God? Talk to me. His baptism. Do you remember? The Bible says that just like our brethren just a while ago, Jesus went down into the water. Amen? Was he sprinkled? I'm, I'm going to keep on picking on you, beloved. I want you to understand this thing. He went down into the water just like our brethren over here did. And we know this because the Bible said he went straight up out of the water and the sky opened up and the father's voice was heard saying what? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the spirit of God in the form of a what? Was it a dove, beloved? Are you sure it wasn't a pigeon? Talk to me. The spirit of God in the form of a? landed upon Jesus, and from 27 AD at the, uh, the River Jordan, Jesus began his ministry as Messiah, as the anointed one. Does that mean that prior to 27 AD, Jesus was not a savior? No. Is Jesus an example to the children even as they're in the womb? Is Jesus an example to our children as he's growing up? Was Jesus an example to our children when they reach adolescence and teenage years? You see, the example to husbands and to wives. So Jesus is always a savior, praise God. But the word Messiah, which means anointed one, means that at a specific point in that 2300-day prophecy, 27 AD, 
the mission of the anointed one, the mission of the Messiah, would begin. Now, our study for this morning is not the 2300 days by itself, but we did see that the 2300 days ended in a specific year. Does anybody remember what that year was? Beloved, am I talking to Seventh-day Adventists this morning? My brother said 1844. Did we see that from our Bibles last night? Did we use any Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentaries to get there? Beloved, we were in the book of Daniel chapter 8, the book of Daniel chapter 9, Ezekiel, Numbers. We went all throughout our Bible to prove from the Word of God that the understanding of a heavenly sanctuary that needed to be cleansed beginning October 22nd, 1844, is not a Seventh-day Adventist invention. It was Bible truth. Do we believe in Bible truth this morning? Do you know if we don't believe in Bible truth this morning, I have nothing to share with you. And even if you wanted something other than Bible truth, do you know Brother Paul could not give that to you? Pastor Rob would send me right home, amen? We want Bible truth for our feet, sure foundation. My question this morning is 177 years beyond 1844, why are you and I Seventh-day Adventists? Do you want to know the answer to the question? Beloved, it is important for us to understand what it is that makes us special. Do you know that in the Bible, Names have significance. Every name that God gives, say that with me, every name that God gives has a special mission attached to it. Do you know that if you study in your Bible, you'll see the slideshow is running ahead. Do you know that if you study in your Bible, you will see that whenever God gives a name, there is a mission attached to the name. There was a man in the book of Genesis by the name of Jacob. Do we know who that was? Jacob's name was changed by God to the name Israel. Isn't that right? And the name Israel means overcomer, whereas Jacob before meant supplanter. There was a woman by the name of Sarai whose name was changed to Sarah. That's Abraham's wife. And her name, according to Genesis 17, meant that she would be the mother of many nations. There was a man by the name of Jesus. Do you know him? What did his name mean, beloved, according to Matthew 1 and verse 21? Savior from sin. Ye shall call his name Jesus because he shall save his people not in their sin, but guess what? From their sins. The Bible also refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God, and the name meant that he would take away the sins of the world. When we call him Emmanuel, it means that he is God with us. Do you know that it is imperative that we have a close, intimate, and personal relationship with Jesus in every name that he carries? A man may know Jesus as a savior from sin, but if the man doesn't know Jesus as the Lamb of God, the sin he claims to be saved from is never taken away. He stays in that sinful condition. Do you know that a man can have a relationship with the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but if he does not have a close, intimate, and personal, what did I say? Personal relationship with Jesus, can that man ever say that he is God with him? Beloved, Jesus is a personal Savior, and every name that God gives comes with a special mission. But just because there is a calling on your life, Do you know that just because there is a calling on your life, just because you and I call ourselves Christians or call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists, that does not guarantee the mission's accomplishment. There was an angel in the Bible by the name of Lucifer. What was his name? Does anybody know what Lucifer's name means? Light bearer. Now, if you study the Bible, Lucifer didn't always stay Lucifer, did he? He became Satan, the devil, the adversary of our souls. Isn't that right? an accuser of the brethren. Now, is an accuser of the brethren a bearer of light? So while God gave him the name with the mission to bring light to the world, Lucifer chose, Lucifer did what? Chose, rather than to accomplish his mission, to do something else. In the Bible Echo, November 1st, 1892, we were told, Satan had been Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer 
of God's glory in heaven, and second to Jesus in power and in majesty. In the words of inspiration, he is described as the one who sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But Lucifer had perverted the beauty and power with which he was endowed by the Creator, and his light had become darkness. His light had become what? Do you know that Jesus can give you the right name? Jesus can give you the right mission. But unless you and I choose to accomplish the mission, it is never accomplished in our lives. Do you know that Jesus had the power to live according to his will rather than his Father? Did you know that? Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but what? Jesus made a choice. In the same way Jesus chose to fulfill his mission, you and I have a mission today that can only be accomplished if we do what? Choose to accomplish it. We must choose, beloved. Now, what is in our name? Seventh-day Adventist. What does that name mean? Somebody talk to me. What does it mean to be a seventh-day Adventist? Let's start with the first two words. Seventh day. What day is that? Is that today? All right, but then you better talk to me like you know your prophetic day, beloved. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In the very name that God gave you, there is a memorial of creative power. Did you know that? There's the remembrance of Christ as your creator. Now that word Adventist, does anyone remember what it means? It means that we believe in the second coming or the advent of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe in the seventh day this morning? Well, then as a friend of mine likes to say, you almost sound like a Seventh-day Adventist. (laughs) Do you know that in order to be a Seventh-day Adventist, it's not just the Sabbath. Seventh-day Baptists have that. It's not just the Advent. There are many Christian denominations who believe Jesus is coming. When we begin to understand the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, it is then and only then, beloved, that you and I truly become Seventh-day Adventists. I have friends that I went to school with who have never heard what I'm talking about right now. We went to Adventist school together. We graduated Adventist schools together. Some of us, myself included, were expelled from Adventist schools. I told you some of the story a long time ago. But beloved, in order for a man in our generation to be a Seventh-day Adventist, it takes more than gathering on Saturday. It takes more than merely believing Jesus is coming. God is preparing a people to stand in our generation. How important is preparation? You remember a man by the name of Noah? God told Noah that a flood was coming, didn't he? And Noah went and Noah made sure that he bought 500 Ferraris so that he and all his friends could make it out of the flood. Amen? Beloved, don't laugh. You're hurting my feelings. What did Noah do when God told him a flood was coming? He built an The point that I'm making, is there anything wrong with a Ferrari? No, beloved. Brother Paul doesn't have the money, but there's nothing wrong with it. The point that I'm making, beloved, is that every crisis has preparation that must be made, but the preparation has to be made according to the crisis that is coming. If Jesus said a flood is coming, then a thousand horses would not help you. You would need an ark built according to the pattern. Built according to the what? Do you remember in the book of Exodus chapter 25, we saw that God told Moses to make me a sanctuary after the pattern. Beloved, we have to get into the ark in our generation. And when you study the Hebrew sanctuary, you'll find that the only place there's an ark, you know it's not in the outer court. The outer court, you have the altar of sacrifice, you have the the labor, which symbolized baptism. There's no ark there. You go into the holy place, you find the seven-branch candlestick, the altar of incense, the table of shoe bread, amen? But there's no ark there. The only place we find our ark of safety, beloved, is in that most holy place. Beloved, today is October 23rd, is it not? Do you know what yesterday was? Yesterday was 177 years since Jesus entered into that most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to cleanse you and I. Now question, are we cre- do we believe in creation? Do you know that David says that all God is simply trying to do is to create in me a clean heart and to renew a right spirit in me? When God said, let there be light, did it take 177 years for light to come? No. 
When God said, let the earth bring forth fruit and produce, did it take 177 years then for that to happen? So why is it, beloved, in our generation that when the same creator, is he the same creator? When the same creator says, I will create in you a clean heart, why is it taken 177 years for God's people to actually experience what the creative word has said? Do you want to know what the difference is, beloved? When God said, let there be light and let there be uh, celestial bodies and all of these things, the sun wasn't fighting with unbelief. Do you know that? But when God's word comes to you and I, we have to choose either to believe it or not to believe it. And that is the issue that Jesus has been having for 177 years with our people. Those who call themselves Seventh-day Adventists by name. God has been speaking all along. Same creative power. Same effect if we would believe, but for 177 years, rather than faith, Jesus has found unbelief in our hearts. Beloved, I've been talking to you all series, not about some Jesus from, from, from far away, but a God that is near, who desires a close, intimate, and what? Personal relationship. Do you believe that Jesus actually has interest in you? Do you actually know that? I haven't gotten to speak with everyone in this room. I've spoken with a few of you, and I've heard personal testimonies, beloved. When I tell you Jesus actually cares about the little things, or what we call the little things, I'm telling you the truth. That same Jesus is getting ready to come again, not for a people who are going to get to know him, but for a people who are right now spending every bit of time we have with him. Now that name, Seventh-day Adventist, points us back to the creation week, doesn't it? On day one, God created earth, space, time, and light. On day two, our creator made the atmosphere. On day three, God created land and plant life. On day four, beloved, he created the sun, the moon, the stars, and the celestial bodies. On day five, God created the birds, the fish, etc. But on day six, God did something very special, didn't he? What did God make on day six, beloved? Talk to me. God made man. Men by ourselves, is that what he did? Male and female created he them, amen? It was on the sixth day that God made man. It was on the sixth day that God made woman. It is on the sixth day that God wedded Adam and Eve. Did you know that? The sixth day was the first marriage. Beloved, some of you not happy about your marriages? The sixth day was the first marriage where Adam and Eve married. Right there in the Garden of Eden, God celebrated the very first marriage with Adam and Eve. But on the seventh day, God did something very, very special. What did God do, beloved? Talk to me, you're Seventh-day Adventists. He made the Sabbath, not for the Jew, but for man, and the Sabbath was our rest. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Sabbath, beloved. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were what? Let me read it again. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God did what? Ended his work. Did you know that the Sabbath is a memorial of an ended work by God? Whenever we're talking about the Sabbath, we're talking about the finishing of a work that is done by God. Are we following? Now, the Bible says in Exodus 31, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath shall ye keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does what? sanctifies you. Follow the thought, beloved. In the book of Exodus, uh, Genesis rather, the Bible says that the Sabbath is a sign of a finished work. What kind of work? In the book of Exodus, the Bible says that the Sabbath is a sign that God is the only one who can sanctify us. Who can do what? Did you know that the name, therefore, Seventh Day Adventist, means that when God finishes his work, of sanctifying a people, the advent will come. 
We began this series by asking the question, where is Jesus and why the delay? Beloved, we live in 2021, amen? 2021. How long has the message been preached that Jesus would be coming again? We saw that from 31 AD, when he died and he resurrected and he went to heaven, the disciples have been preaching, Jesus is coming soon, amen? Beloved, from 31 AD to 2021, does that sound like soon to you and I? Is God a liar? So then talk to me, what is the issue? Why has Christ not been able yet to fulfill his promise of coming soon? The Bible says in the book of James chapter five that Jesus is near even at the door. How many of you came in through those doors? Did it take you 2,000 years to do it? So then you have an understanding of what soon actually means. Are you better at keeping time than God is? No, beloved. God has been waiting. God has been doing what? Now somebody says, Brother Paul, I've been taught all my life that we're waiting for Christ. Is that true? But is that the end of the picture? If we are waiting for Jesus, and Jesus is not here yet, though COVID is taking lives, and people are dying outside, then it seems like Jesus is the one with the problem. But when we begin to recognize, according to the word of God, that God is waiting to finish a work of sanctifying his people, we find ourselves in 2021, not because God cannot keep his promise, but because you and I have not yet entered into that close, intimate, and personal relationship with him. Do you desire that relationship this morning? Beloved, our name, Seventh Day, implies a finished work. Our name, seventh day, implies a sanctification process. And when that process is finished, the word Adventist means Jesus will come. Does the Bible teach what I'm saying right now? Let's look in our Bibles in the book of Joel chapter 2. I want you to see from your Bible that the reason why Christ has not yet returned, beloved, is not because God is not good at keeping his promises, but it is because you and I have not yet entered into that close, intimate and personal relationship with him that alone can sanctify us. We're in the book of Joel, chapter 2. Say amen when you're with me. The Bible says in the book of Joel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify, do what, beloved? Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. The Bible says, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Do what to the the congregation? Sanctify the congregation, beloved. The Bible says, sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breast. What is the next word? Let. What is the next word in your Bible? It says, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. I want you to catch this, beloved. The Bible says that the reason why Christ the bridegroom has not yet returned is because you and I won't let him come back. All our lives, beloved, we have been believing that, that, that we're looking for the coming of Christ and we're only waiting. Do you know the Bible says that we're not only to wait, but we're to actually hasten the coming of Jesus? If it is in the power of God's people, by the condition of our hearts, to hasten the coming of Christ, it is also in our power, by the condition of our hearts, to delay the same coming. Now, some of you may have not been here the night that we went through Where is Jesus and Why the Delay, but I showed you, beloved, that for years, Christ has been waiting to sanctify a people, and every year that goes by in eternity, where we refuse to receive the experience, is another year of war. It's another year of death. It's another year of bloodshed, more and more viruses. How many of you want to see what comes next after COVID-19? COVID-19 is enough, don't you say? Beloved, I am sick and tired of the death, are you? I am sick and tired of the war, are you? Even the rumors of war get me sick, beloved. I'm tired of this world. I want Jesus to come in my generation. Is that the desire of your heart? The Bible says in the book of Revelation, behold, I come quickly. And the response of God's people in these last days is even so. Come, Lord Jesus. The words even so imply an inconvenience. Did you know that? 
Somebody says, Lord, you're saying you're coming quickly. I understand that. But I wanted 25 children before you came back. Lord, I want to be Abraham himself. But even so, come Lord Jesus. Somebody says, Lord, I know that you said you're coming quickly, that it's possible if I would just give you my heart for you to come in our generation. But Lord, I have all of these plans. Even so, are we willing to lay all on the altar for Christ? You're quiet. Now, what I'm not speaking, beloved, is that we should give up on our desire to have children. Did I say that? I did not say that. Give it to the Lord and allow the Lord to lead. What I did not say is that we should take all of our plans and throw them out the window. Did I say that? Give them to the Lord and let him lead. The Bible says we are to occupy. Do what? Occupy until Christ comes. Do you know the fact that the Bible says we must occupy implies that God gave you and I an occupation? God gave us a work that needs to be done, and until the work is finished, Christ cannot yet come. Our name means that when the work of sanctification is complete, Jesus will come. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, paragraph 1 through 2, we're told, when the fruit is brought forth, what is the next word? Immediately, he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then, when beloved? Then he will come. Beloved, not a moment before. The Bible refers to the coming of Christ as a harvest. Have you ever heard this language before? Have you ever heard the language of a harvest before? How many of you have ever gardened before? Planted a seed and watched it grow? Amen. Water, sunshine, all these things. Now, I've asked you before and you laugh. Don't laugh at me today, beloved. I'm very serious. When a man plants tomato seeds, what does he expect to have? What was that? Tomatoes. If a man planted cucumber seeds, what would he expect to have? Do you know that the Bible speaks in Genesis 3.15 of Jesus as the seed... The what, beloved? The seed of the woman. If God plants Christ in you and I, then what does God expect to see out of our lives? Do you know the problem today, beloved? Is that many people claim the planting of tomatoes and come back to God with a harvest of cucumbers. Many people plant cucumbers today and come back to God with a harvest other than what God expects. God has planted the seed of Christ in his church, and the church looks absolutely nothing like that seed. But do you know we, we serve a Savior who can take a sinner even like me, a sinner even like you, and if we would but give our hearts to Jesus, then the seed that God has planted will be the testimony of your life. How many of you actually want to be like Jesus? Jesus. Somebody says, no, Brother Paul, Jesus had his beard pulled and he was spit on and he was crucified. I don't want to do that. I'm going to ask again, how many of you want to be like Jesus? Those are some faithful hands. Beloved, I want to be like Jesus in my home. I want to be like Jesus at my workplace. I want to be like Jesus at school. And everywhere that he leads me, there is no better place for the Christian than at the feet of Jesus. Do you know by the grace of God where I intend to leave you this morning? At the feet of Jesus. Now don't be afraid to be at the feet of Jesus. You know Jesus washed feet. Is that, isn't that right? Yes, he did. Jesus washed the feet of all of those men, beloved. Jesus' desire is to cleanse us, to cleanse our way, to give us a newness of life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Some of us fail to enter into that close, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus because we're holding on to old sorenesses from an old life. Somebody says, Brother Paul, I don't know how I can follow Jesus. I was born a homosexual, for example. Have you ever heard that, that, that testimony before? How many of you believe that you can be born a homosexual? I see a hand. Do you know that that's not even the question that the Bible asks? 
We shouldn't be arguing with people struggling with homosexuality about whether or not they were born that way. My Bible says that I was born in sin and I was shaping in, guess what? Iniquity. The question that the Bible asks is not how you were born. The question that the Bible asks is have you been born again? Beloved, do you know that when we begin to treat people not as their sins, but as people sick, just like us, in need of Christ, and we bring them to the same Jesus, Jesus himself does not treat people the way you and I sometimes treat one another. Did you know that? But God is preparing a people. What is he doing? That anyone who comes in contact with us will be able to say, these people that are called Seventh-day Adventists have spent time at the feet of Jesus. Beloved, I have homosexual friends back home that Jesus is working on right now. I have friends back home right now that are drug dealers that Jesus is working on right now. I have friends in every and any aspect of walk of life that you can mention to me that Jesus is working on right now. The point is, in order to reach those people, it's going to take a real encounter with the God that we profess to believe in. Do you know the world can tell when we're lying about our relationship with Christ? The Bible refers to him as the bread of life. Have you ever read that? The Bible refers to him as the water of life. Have you ever read that? How many of you drink water? How many of you drink enough water? Do you know that it is impossible to fake a relationship with water, beloved? If a man shows up at your door and he's trying to sell you water, he says, this is the best thing, it's better than Poland Spring, it's better than Aquafina, it's better than anything, where's my bottle of water? It's better than anything you can give. And the same man, you look upon his lips and they are as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Is that a man that has a relationship with that water bottle? No, beloved. Let's say the same man put on some Blistex to hide the fact. You know, some of us like to do that. Drink water, beloved. Let's say the man covered up the fact that his lips were dry so that you couldn't tell he had no relationship with the water, but then the man goes to your bathroom to use it. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And it looks like apple juice in the toilet bowl. Is that a man that has a relationship with water? Beloved, do you know that in the same way we cannot fake a relationship with water, it is impossible. It is what? To fake a relationship with Jesus? Jesus is the water of life, beloved, and he purifies. What does he do? Everyone with whom he comes in contact. Now we're coming to a close. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible said, let there be light. Does anybody know the light that Jesus was referring to when he said these words? When God said, let there be light, was he talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars? Are you sure? If you turn to the book of Genesis, you'll see that it wasn't until the fourth day. What day, beloved? The fourth day that Jesus made the sun, the moon, and the stars. So when Jesus said, let there be light, he wasn't talking about celestial light. What was he talking about? The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There are four things, how many things? In the word of God that the Bible calls light. God's law, God's word, his son, and guess who? His church. God calls all of these things light. The Bible says that his law is light. The Bible says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And Jesus said unto his church, you are the light of the world. Do you know your Bible says in 2 Corinthians that God who commanded light to shine, the light he was talking about was the light that shines in the face of Jesus. It is the light of the glory of God that shines in the face of Jesus. Seventh-day Adventists? Seventh-day Adventists? Hello? What is God's glory? Now, now don't tell me light. We've already covered that. The light of God. Do you remember in the book of Exodus, Moses asked God to show him his glory. And God decided to explain to Moses, not just light, but who he was. He said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, full of abundance, all of these characteristics, God's glory, 
God's glory, God's glory is his character. It is what, beloved? Can people see the glory of God in you? My brother said, I, ho I hope so too. Can people see the character of Jesus in you? Do you know that in order to reach the people, that is going to have to happen for you and I? The Bible says, speaking of Christ, in him was life, and his life was the what? The light of men. When God said, let there be light, he was telling you what his priority was concerning humanity. Do you know that let there be light were the very first words God said over our world? The very first words. Now, if a man was in a, a condition where he was hungry and he was thirsty, and the man told you, give me some food, what do you suppose was his priority? Was it the drink or was it the food? The food. The very first thing we say tells us what our priority is. And if God's first words over our planet were, let there be light, then God's priority concerning Christians, concerning Seventh-day Adventists, concerning you and I today, beloved, is that the light, which is the life of Jesus, be seen in us. The Bible says this is the whole duty of man. The Bible says, uh, we're told in Desire of Ages, it were, uh, that the earth was dark. The earth was what? Dark. Is dark and light synonymous? God said, let there be light. Inspiration says that there was something called darkness that came upon our planet. It says the earth was dark through what? Misapprehension of God. Do you know that it was never God's intention for people to be confused about his love? It was never God's intention for people to be confused about the way he feels and the thoughts he thinks concerning us. Are people confused about the love of God today? Are people confused about how God treats sinners today? Now, if you're confused about how God treats a sinner and you yourself are a sinner, is that a God you will come to? Talk to me, beloved. In order for sinners to come to Jesus, they have to learn by you and I that Jesus is in fact a friend of, guess who? Sinners. Jesus has not come, beloved, to call saints to repentance, but to call sinners like you and I to repentance. We are told that the earth was dark through misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened and that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. But this could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love. And love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or by authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character is what, beloved? His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Now, I'm going to skip ahead here. We're told in education that the redemption plan of God is the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. Were we made in God's image? Do we reflect that image today? Somebody said yes. Well, praise the Lord for you. Amen? Amen. Many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we don't. God needs to restore his image in us. Isn't that right? He has to restore our families. He has to restore our marriages. He has to restore our sibling relationships. God is a God of restoring. He is restoring everything in our generation. And the redemption plan is the restoration in the human soul of the image of God. Now, the plan of redemption, beloved, is simply the way. It is what? the way that God accomplishes this task for man. How he restores us is the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption is the way that God does that. Now talk to me. The Bible says in Psalm 77 and verse 13, thy way, O God, is where? So then where do we find the full outline of the plan of redemption? In the sanctuary. Is the sanctuary on earth, those of you who were here last night, where is the sanctuary located? Give me one witness that told you that last night. Don't say Brother Paul. Did Moses say that? Yes, he did. He said, I built the tabernacle after a pattern. Did he not say that? 
Did the Apostle Paul agree that that tabernacle was not on earth but in heaven? Did we see that John not only believed the same, but he actually saw the same in vision? Did King David say that he wrote that for the generation to come? So then the sanctuary we're talking about is not on earth. Where is it located? You almost sound like Seventh-day Adventists. The sanctuary we're talking about is not located on earth. It is located where? In heaven. And Jesus is doing a work of cleansing that sanctuary. Now, the Hebrew sanctuary, outer court, holy place, holy place, gives us phase one, count with me, phase two, and what? Phase three. And I told you already, beloved, that the majority of the Christian world today is seeking to overcome Satan with only one-third of the plan. Now, will that do? Is the sacrifice of the lamb important? Oh, it's critical, beloved. It's, 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 it's severely important. Amen? Now, what the lamb did on the cross was so that Christ, as a living priest, could carry out the remainder of the work. Do you know that without the shedding of blood, there would be no taking away of sin? Did Jesus have to die? Yes, he did. Did he stay dead? He resurrected. Where did he go? Why did he go there? To prepare a place. And he does that in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Phase one, phase two, and phase three, or in other words, start... Middle, and what? I'm going to say that one more time. Start, middle, and what? Do you remember what the name seventh day implies? That when God finishes his work of sanctifying a people, then the advent, the second coming of Jesus will come. Do we remember this? Start, middle, finish. The Bible shows us from the sanctuary how Christ descended to start his work. We know that the great controversy began in heaven. Is that right? Revelation chapter? Revelation chapter 5, beloved? 12. I heard 12. Is it Revelation chapter 12 where the great controversy began? The war in heaven. Beloved, don't be afraid when I ask you questions. I'm your friend. I'm on your side. It's always an open book test with Brother Paul. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, beginning at verse 7, and there was war in? So then the great controversy began not on earth, it began where? In heaven, Revelation chapter 12. Now the Bible says that when Christ came to earth, he lived by the word. Man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Did Jesus live by the word? Did Jesus let his light so shine before men that they may see his good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven? Yes, he did. Was Jesus living a life of prayer? That's interesting, beloved. Did Jesus pray? If Jesus needed prayer to overcome our sinful nature, how much more do you and I need to pray and speak with God? Did Jesus pray? Do you know Jesus wasn't a pretender? Anything he did, he did it of necessity. Jesus prayed because he knew in order to set a right example for you and I in overcoming our fallen nature, he would need to show us all of the necessities. Is prayer a necessity? Prayer is the breath of the soul, I read somewhere, beloved. Was Jesus baptized? And was he crucified? Yes, he was. Now, on the cross, Jesus said those three words. Say them with me. It is finished. When Jesus died on the cross, was he saying the entire plan was done? Talk to me. He was saying phase one is finished, the power that we lacked, the Bible said that when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died because you and I lacked the power to live a holy life. But when he died, beloved, the new covenant, the what? The promise of God was ratified by the blood of Jesus. Everyone that lived before the cross, do you know that they lived righteous lives? Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Enoch, only by faith in the coming Lamb, Jesus Christ. Do you know that on the Mount of Transfiguration, the uh, inspiration tells us and the Bible tells us that Moses and Elijah came down from heaven and had a conversation with Jesus just before his crucifixion? I can almost imagine what the conversation was like. Lord, I can't wait till you get to that cross, respectfully, because the only reason why I'm in heaven now is because of what you said you would do. I have trusted what you said you would do from before your crucifixion, and now the time has come. Did Jesus shy away? You know, the Bible says he went straight to the cross for the joy that was set before him. 
While Jesus was facing death, beloved, and separation from his father, Jesus went to the cross because he said, you and I are worth more. He was willing to take the risk to prepare a people. To do what? And the Bible says in regards to the cross, now is come strength. Phase one, successfully completed. Did Christ stay on earth or did he ascend to finish his work? Was Jesus resurrected? Does baptism symbolize newness of life? Yes. Did John see Jesus in the midst of the seven candlesticks in Revelation? Yes, he did. It is Jesus that makes intercession today. It is Jesus that imparts the living manna today. And on October 22nd, 1844, judgment began at the house of God. Judgment began at the house of God. Now, just before I leave, let me ask you a question. Is there anyone under the sound of my voice right now who is being judged? I hear too many mixed, mixed, uh, mixed answers, beloved. I heard yes, and I heard no. Is there anyone in this room who right now is being judged by God? Now, you may be uh, going through some tests in your life, but the Bible teaches that when the coming of Christ occurs... It is the dead in Christ that are resurrected, guess how? First. Now, why do you suppose they're, they're rewarded by Jesus first? It is because judgment was first with the dead that believe in Christ. Now, that's a study, beloved. But if we're seven-day Adventists, these are things that we should, we should be uh, reviewing and studying so that we can know it better for ourselves. Judgment begins at the house of God, not with the living, but with the dead. Men like Righteous Abel. Do you remember Abel? Abel had a brother named Cain. What did Cain do to Abel? He killed him. So is, is, is Abel dead? Did he believe in Christ? Yes. His judgment is before the judgment of the living. In October 22nd of 1844, God began the judgment of the dead who died in Christ. But beloved, I want you to understand in our generation, a time is coming very, very soon where judgment will pass from the cases of the dead to guess who? the cases of the living. Is there anyone under the sound of my voice who can pass that judgment? All your hands should have went up because I've showed you, beloved, that we have an advocate with the Father. We have a lawyer. What is his name? Jesus. Can you trust Jesus with your case? Is Jesus able to get you through the judgment? In Colossians chapter 3, we saw that Christ is not just our judge. Christ is our life. So if God is going to evaluate our lives according to our relationship with Jesus, I believe that we're living in a time where we need a close, intimate, and personal one with him. Now that time of the holy place was from Pentecost all the way to October 22nd, 1844. Somebody says, Brother Paul, how do you know that the holy place time began at Pentecost? Well, because after Christ's resurrection, he went to heaven, amen? And it was when he was in heaven that the Spirit came down on the disciples on the day of, guess what? Pentecost. Where was Jesus on the day of Pentecost? In heaven. He was in the holy place. But on October 22nd, 1844, 177 years ago yesterday, Jesus moved from the holy place into the most holy place of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Phase one, complete. Praise God. Phase two, guess what? Complete. Praise God. Phase three. Phase three is still pending, beloved. Has Christ yet returned for a cleansed people? It's because we're not yet cleansed. Can God cleanse a people? Then do you suppose he can get that done in our generation? Beloved, what we're talking about right now is what makes us Seventh-day Adventists. It's not just the Sabbath. The Seventh-day Baptist has that. It's not just the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of glory. Many Christians believe in that. But this doctrine of Christ actually preparing a people in that most holy place of a heavenly sanctuary after October 22nd, 1844, that is our prophetic birth date. That is what makes you a Seventh-day Adventist. And if you believe that, beloved, well, then you're a Seventh-day Adventist. Beloved, Jesus is seeking to do something very special with us. 
I believe that it is time to finish. To do what? Finish the work. What is the work of God? Jesus says this is the work of God, that you believe. That you do what, beloved? Believe on him whom the Father hath sent. If we believe on Christ, Christ is able to take you and I and to make us sinless saints. Do you believe that? No, some of you are afraid of that word sinless, beloved. We, we sing the song, but do we believe it? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is what? Talk to me. Power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you over evil what? A victory win. Why do we sing it if we don't believe it? Beloved, God is seeking to prepare a people. I believe that people is you and it is I. The question is, what will we do with his invitation? The question is, how long will we halt between two opinions? Beloved, if God is God, then serve him. I have a very close pastor friend back in New York who told me all the time, he said, listen, Brother Paul, if you're going to go into ministry, you're going to have to be all in. I said, all right, that sounds good. What, 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 what are you saying? He said, no, you don't understand what I'm saying. If you're going to be a Christian for Jesus, you're going to have to give up everything this world has to offer. Many Christians today have half of their foot in the church, and guess where the other half is? Beloved, do you know that if Jesus shows up and we have half of the foot in the church and half of the foot in the world, then we are double losers? You mean to tell me that a man will pretend to be a Christian and never experience everything that's out there in the world, miserable the whole time, coming to church on Sabbath, and then Jesus shows up and Jesus says, I never knew you? We lose both eternal life and guess which life? Beloved, if you're going to be in the world, I would rather... Now, now let, me, let, me, let me say it the way Jesus said it so you don't get it wrong. Jesus said, I would rather that you were cold than to pretend to be on fire for me. I would rather that you were hot than pretend to be on fire for me. But halt ye no longer between two opinions. If God is God, serve him. But if the world and the things of the world are your God, then serve them. Beloved, I would rather have all of Jesus... Take it all and give me Jesus. What do you say? We're finished, beloved. We started out in the book of Genesis chapter 315 with our scripture reading, where Jesus made the promise to crush the head of the serpent. Did he not make that promise? Has Jesus crushed the head of the serpents yet? Do you know that the place where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha, the place of a skull, the place of what? Do you know that what Jesus did on the cross was a beginning of something he can only finish in the most holy place? Did Jesus crush the head of Satan at the cross? Talk to me. Is Satan running around today? Somebody said no? Are you not tempted? Can I show you one last text from your Bible? They said no, Pastor Rob. Can I show you one last text from your Bible, beloved? Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 16. I want you to see something from your Bible, beloved. Now, the Apostle Paul, he wrote the book of Romans, amen? Did the Apostle Paul write the book of Romans? Did the Apostle Paul uh, preach and teach Jesus after the crucifixion of Christ? Yes, he did. Romans, chapter 16. I want you to see something very specific. In the book of Romans chapter 16, beginning at verse 19, are you there? The Bible says, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto, the, unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Verse 20, beloved, Paul said these words after the crucifixion. And the God of peace shall... Bruise Satan, guess where? Under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, I want you to follow the thought as we close right here. The Apostle Paul says, after the cross, that the God of peace would bruise Satan under whose feet? Our feet shortly. I'm going to ask you again. Did Jesus crush the head of Satan at the cross?
It's a trick question if you haven't figured it out yet. The answer is, Jesus began that crushing, did he? Was Jesus victorious over Satan? Yes, he was. Do you know the Bible calls Jesus the head and the church is the body? Jesus is the head and the church is the what? So then we are one, guess with who? Christ. Now, if the head, which is Jesus, crushes Satan at the cross, but the body that belongs to the same Jesus have yet to have victory over sin in our lives, then when the Apostle Paul is saying that the Lord God would bruise Satan under your feet shortly, the Lord is simply telling us that in the same way, 31 AD, Christ began that bruising on the, on the devil's head, God is going to reproduce in you and I the same condition that was in Jesus. And in our lives, the very victory we find in the life of Christ will be the victory that we experience. Is that a victory you desire? Beloved, I asked you why you're seven-day Adventist. At the end of the Day of Atonement, the high priest symbolizing Jesus came out and he put his hand on the head. On the what? The head of the scapegoat. Why did the high priest put his hands on the head of the scapegoat? It was because in Genesis 3.15, God did not promise to put his foot on the tail of Satan, did he? Is that what he said? I will crush the tail of Satan? No, beloved. He said, I will bruise thy head. Do you know that it is only sin? It is only sin. Say those words with me. It is only sin that can do that. Some of us are thinking about Jesus as though Jesus is in heaven, washing his foot and getting it ready. And as soon as he comes through the clouds, he's going to put his foot down. He might unstrap the sandals first. And he's going to strike the head of Satan. Is that biblical? That's not biblical, beloved. If you study in the life of Christ, what was it that killed the lamb? Sin. What do you suppose it is that is going to destroy the scapegoat at the end of time? Sin. I told you that grenade is dangerous, beloved. The pin has been out of that grenade called sin all of this time, and we're running around as children with that grenade ready to detonate. How many of you, by the grace of God, are willing to give the grenade to Christ? How many of you in this room are willing to give all of your sin to our high priest? Do you know what Jesus will do with your sins? He will take them, and at the end of the Day of Atonement, he will place all of them on the head of the scapegoat, finishing forever the promise that was made in Genesis 3.15. That is why we're Seventh-day Adventists, beloved. Now, is there anyone in this room who's proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist? Beloved, I'm very, 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 I'm saying it in Spanish. I'm very, very proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist, not because of our denomination merely. Name means mission, yes, but only when we choose can the mission be accomplished. I am proud to be a Seventh-day Adventist because the same Creator who made all things by His Word is creating in me a clean heart and renewing a right spirit in me even now. Do you believe in the same Creator? I'm going to bow on my knees right now. Beloved, this is the last time I'm going to pray with you. Did you know that? This is the very last time that I'll be praying with you. This is a special prayer. Do we want to accept the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ? Yes. Show of hands. Are we willing to accept Jesus, not only as a dying Lamb, but as a living priest? Will we give Him all of our sin? Beloved, no longer, no matter how long you struggled with it, there's enough power in His blood to cleanse us of it. Doesn't matter what it is. Jesus can do it where we can.